challenging at some level. Some you might take in your stride, others it may get you a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> Other time you may be very, very skeptical and not even want to believe it. So I'm just uh, giving you a little bit of a warning that you will be very challenged by some of this content. I'll be surprised if no one is challenged. And particularly if you don't know me, some of the things I say you may find very, very hard to accept. That's just a bit of heads up. I'm sort of used to that because I am a little bit radical in how I approach different subjects. So that's what we're going to learn here and cover in this webinar. I've been working in this industry of training business owners since 1997. Just to give you an example, this is one of my earlier clients. I had a lot of understanding about business success principles and how to increase profits in businesses even before I joined the industry. And in 1998, I worked with a builder who said, I need more customers, I want more sales. I said, sure, Bernie, let me teach you some strategies on how to do that. And by teaching him sales strategies, he tripled his sales in a month after me teaching him how to sell the way I teach. So that's an example of what sort of things you can do. And this is going a long way back before I knew a lot more than what I do now about business. Here's a more recent one. Actually, this is in the last 12 months. This is a plumber. Owns a plumbing company. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and his profits jumped from 52000 for a full financial year to 128000 in six months of the next financial year because that's sort of the relevant time frame for my training. So that's about, it's almost a 500% increase in profit and that was without focusing on a sales or marketing strategy to, to achieve this outcome. So a lot of people think that you need to use sales or marketing to grow your business. Well, that's not actually the case and a lot of entrepreneurs would agree with this. A lot of people think marketing is the only way to grow a business. It's actually not. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. Here's a builder that was running at $100,000 loss <coughs> for the financial year. And through my training, we turned it into 220,000 positive profit. And his turnover increased as well. But again, I didn't talk to him about sales or marketing to achieve this outcome. He did it through a lot of other mechanisms. And this is a business that was doing a lot of tenders and quotes. So therefore, the sales and marketing component is not that relevant. So it's an example of what sort of things you can achieve with this information. This is one of my fastest growth clients. They went from 12,000 a month turnover to 120,000 a month turnover in five months. And that was printed up in a national business magazine back in 2002. And this is a, a business from Sydney that I met. They were very skeptical, very cautious, didn't believe most things I tell them, which I seem to have that effect on people. They often find a lot of what I say hard to believe. And that was sort of the outcome for them. And just to give you an idea, sometimes people wonder, would this information work for them in their business, in their industry? And this is some examples. All these businesses increase their profits minimum 50% to 2,000 plus all in less than five months. And that is by no means a complete list of the clients that I have personally worked with in my professional career training business owners on entrepreneurial thinking and better business management and exercises. Now, I could talk a lot more about case studies, but I figure you've probably heard enough. But you just notice that there are wholesale retails, uh, manufacturing service businesses. I don't go and pick a certain industry. Whatever turned up from seminars that I've run for 13 years or marketing I used prior to that, I, I don't chase an industry. It's what turns up is what I work with. And the principles I teach pretty much apply across the board. And a lot of business owners feel that their business is completely different and unique to everybody else. And so therefore, they're looking for someone who has a lot of experience to work with their line of business. And that's something I consider a mindset challenge for them, not for me. And that's all about mindset, which we'll talk about a little bit more. So that's enough about me. Let's get on to some interesting stuff. Millions of businesses across the world, they struggle with four things. From working with business owners, from listening to business owners, telling me, their challenges and what their problems are and what their frustrations are and what annoys them and what they, what they want help with and what they want solutions to, it came down to four constant subjects that kept coming up all the time. Money was a pretty big one. Who wouldn't like more money? We'd like to make more money. We'd like to increase our profits. We'd like to give ourselves a pay rise. So money is a constant challenge or struggle for business owners. Time is a big one. Obviously, we, we always seem to be very busy in our modern day age with technology and phones and everything sort of bombarding us and emails. We have less time now than ever before, so that's a constant challenge that business owners talk to me about. Employees, once you start to grow your business and you've got a few employees, you'll find that that can be a challenge for you as well. And the fourth one is, how do I get enough customers to grow my business? 
So if I said to you now, which I'd like to do, I like to conduct little mini surveys when I'm running different events. If I said to you, how many of these four challenges are you dealing with now? How many would you answer with? If you can type in an answer in your message box, I would love to see it. So how many of these are you dealing with now? One, two, three, four, maybe none. I'm very interested to know your answer on that. So two from one of you, excellent. And if you don't have employees, I have found most of the time when people say less than three, it's often because they don't have employees. And if you're giving me a less than three answer, if you could say, uh, I have less than employees or put a greater than or less than or something sign, that'd be great too. But if you can give me an answer for that, everyone, that'd be fantastic. Very interested in what your answers are to that one. How many of these challenges are you dealing with? Sometimes people don't have a money challenge. Sometimes they just have a time challenge. Sometimes they have a time challenge and they don't have a money challenge. So it depends on different businesses. So thank you for giving me your answer. That's good. <laughs> a couple of them are coming with exclamation marks. That's good. <laughs> Can be a challenge. Some of these are really big. Some of these are not so big. But they are a pretty regular thing. They kept coming up from meeting business owners and talking to them, asking, what do you want help with? What are your challenges? So they kept coming up. Now, question, are all these solvable? Can you solve them? Can you conquer them? Can you overcome all of these problems, all of these challenges in the business permanently? Is that possible? Is that feasible? It's an interesting question. Well, I'd say yes, absolutely. And it comes down to if you can get hold of the information because this is solvable. Does Richard Branson have any of these challenges, do you think? Do you think he stresses and worries and gets frustrated and concerned or apprehensive or upset or anything emotionally based on any of these four challenges? I would say absolutely not. So therefore, they are solvable. There are people that own two, three, four, five, ten businesses. There are people that own multi-million dollar businesses and quite a few of them. So these challenges are all over, all possible to overcome. In fact, I've had clients that don't have any of these challenges anymore because they've stopped working their business completely and a general manager runs their company for them and sometimes they move interstate to where they were when I first met them. So all these challenges are conquerable. Now, there's a little bit of science in this. Now, first bit of mindset, let's talk about this. I find that most business owners that I talk to, when I say, what do you want help with? What would you like help with? Most of them, not all, but most of them would say, I want more customers. And then I say, why do you want more customers? Well, because I need more customers. I need to make more money. Hmm, okay. Money is a separate subject to customers. Now, the thing that I like to focus on with businesses is not actually customers first, even though that's what they feel they need because they feel they need more money and they think customers is how they get it. We'll talk about this as we go on. What I say is let's increase your money without getting any more customers. So who likes the idea of getting a lot more money without needing any more customers? And I would imagine your answer to that would be yes. Who wouldn't like more money without that? Now, this is where I focus very differently what most people do in business. I say let's increase the money in your business because if we can increase the money, as in the profits in your business, put more money in your bank account without getting more customers, we can afford to pay staff actually one or two more staff. If we put another 50 or 100,000 plus into the bank account, we can afford to pay staff. If you can afford to pay more staff to take on some or all of what you currently do, how much time have we freed up? I think we freed up a couple of days, two or three, or maybe even five days a week. Now, when you freed up that two, three, four, five days a week, you personally, which I believe you need to do as a business owner, can start learning very, very effective marketing yourself because if you've got three days a week full-time learning any subject, you're going to get pretty good at it. And then you can go and get all the customers you like from that time that you freed up. And then you can work with excellent markets instead of grabbing the nearest person because you don't have time to assess them or study different marketing companies are offering their services. And you don't just grab the first one that sounds good, that gives you a good pitch. You put a lot of time into reading it and learning it yourself. And then you go and find the really, really good marketers. And then your business starts to explode because extremely good marketing, like I gave you some examples with Bernie the Builder, I tripled his sales in a couple of months. That's extremely good marketing because marketing includes sales skills and a whole lot of other different subjects. So it's an example where, from a mindset perspective, what sometimes people are focusing on is not the area that I tend to focus on. 
marketing, yes, absolutely necessary. And I'll talk about when marketing, I believe, is far more important in your business than just initially. All right, let's go on a bit. The cycle of business success and failure. It's the secret to all success doing anything in life. What happens is that we have a certain mindset. We have a way of thinking. Our brain is programmed, if you like, to think a certain way. Our mindset is a combination of a few things. It's a combination of your personality. It's a combination of your belief systems. And it's a combination of your experiences in life. All these make up your mindset. Now, your mindset absolutely dictates the type of thoughts that you have. You think a certain way. You have certain thoughts based on this mindset. Unfortunately, a mindset is a box. And you can think as much as you like, but you will still be contained at some level in your thinking. It's very, very hard to think outside the box because the box is your personality. It is your beliefs. It is your experience. So therefore, the way you talk to yourself, the way you think, what sort of thoughts you have is governed. And that is very, very hard to change because of our background that led us to this point, our life experiences, our personality traits and things like that. So when we have a mindset, that absolutely dictates the type of activity, the things that you say is important. Like the last slide, people say, well, I need more customers. And I say, well, okay, that's your mindset to say that you need more customers. What if we freed up your time? Wouldn't that give you more time to get more customers? What if we taught you how to empower your staff to take on more responsibility and taught you some very advanced teaching methodologies where your employees started to take more on more responsibility and we could teach you to teach them, therefore free up your time that way? What if we taught you how to increase your net profit margin so you could afford to pay more staff and then we free up your time that way? So this is a mindset that people don't understand that the way they think absolutely dictates the type of things that they focus on. Their focus is their activity, and then their activity determines their results. Now, this is the process. If you want to change your results, people say, well, tell me what to do. And I've told business owners a lot of things to do, then they nod their head, and then they ignore me and think the instructions don't apply to them. And then they keep doing exactly what they're doing because their thinking, their mindset sabotages the instructions that I give them. So therefore, I've learned if I'm going to be effective at creating huge improvements, not little, I mean huge improvements in businesses, I've got to change mindsets because the one I teach them how to think a certain way and then they think more entrepreneurially, they think outside the box, then their activity is different, therefore then they get different results. So that's the process that I take business owners through. But a lot of people, when they're not getting the results, they don't start to say, gee, I need to change my thinking. They typically say, I need to change the activities that I'm doing. So they try and change their activities, but they tend not to change them much because they haven't changed their thinking prior to the activity, let alone their mindset. So this is a very insightful way of looking at what goes on in business and life, that people think a certain way, therefore it dictates their activity, therefore it always dictates their results. And if you think about it, if you're saying you're very busy now, how many years have you been saying that? What's changed? If you're doing it tough with money, well, has that changed? So it's an example where you start saying, well, hang on, based on my results, I don't need a small improvement. I need a radical improvement. And if I need a radical improvement, you don't get radical improvements from tiny changes of thoughts. You get radical improvement from a radical change of thinking. So therefore, we need to have a, a, a humility, if you like, an acceptance that we need to change. Until we have acceptance, we're not really teachable. And this stops us having the results that we like. So are your results what you desire? I know some of you I've talked to you a little bit. Uh, some I haven't talked to you. I've just emailed. Some of you I haven't heard from as far as email responses or conversations. But are you getting the results you desire? And if not, then it comes down to, well, how much different do you want them to be? If you want to increase your profits 300% or you want to pay yourself $200,000 or more or you want to free up three or five days a week, if you want radical improvements in where you are right now, well, are you prepared to radically change your thinking? Are you prepared to trust someone and explicitly to the letter precisely do every single thing they say? Because for most people, that is a radical change, to do exactly what someone says instead of going, oh, yeah, but... Well, yeah, I didn't have a good time, I didn't get to it, and all that sort of thing can get in the way of radical improvements in our results in life. So this is just a very powerful concept I'd like to start talking to you about, because entrepreneurs have a radically different mindset. Their, their box is pretty huge, 
Whereas often when we're not at that level of success, our box is fairly small and the thoughts are not that radically different. Whereas entrepreneurs tend to have fairly radically different thoughts to most people. They have an ability to think very differently outside the box. So outside the box, a very big box, therefore their activity is different, therefore their results are very different. All right, let's keep going. Here's something that can be a little bit hard to get your head around. I'll, I'll give you a bit of a heads up on that. This is a very powerful concept, but it explains where all of our time goes in our life. And every person on the planet, I can describe their life from looking at these five different areas. We have an area one out of the five, and this is where we work hard. This is where we have to work or we don't get paid. It's called having a job, being self-employed. It's where if you don't work, you don't get paid. That's called area one out of the five areas. Area two is what you do when you're not working, typically, not always, but we're studying, we're learning, we're reading books, we're going out with family outings, we're looking after kids, we're going to school functions or going on holidays. All this is area two activity. Now, most people in their life, in this whole of society, live in area one and live in area two and rarely go into areas three, four, or five. Now, often with our society, we're taught TV ads, magazines, books say we need to study, we need to work hard to get ahead, you've got to work hard. Now work hard is what area one is, which means you work hard, you work hard, you work hard all your life and then 95% of people retire broke even though they worked hard all their life because that's what area one's about. It's just, it's like swimming with lead shoes on. You swim with lead shoes, one day you're going to drown, you can't not drown. Area three is about leveraged income, it's where you do something once, get no benefit at all for days, weeks, months or maybe even a year or two in the future. But what you're doing today has a leveraged effect where you are getting paid over and over and over for work you do once. So if I said to you in the last week, how much area three activity have you done in your life where you did leveraged income activity, where you work once and you don't have to do what it is that you did because it's done. It's like I created this PowerPoint yesterday in about three hours, spent about an hour on it yesterday. I don't have to do it again. I'm using this for a webinar at 10 p.m. tonight, and I'm going to be doing it for a webinar in the morning at 7 a.m. talking to America. So I've done this work once, and this will turn into income over time because of work I've done once. I do about 20 hours a week in Area 3. Most people are lucky to do one. And most business owners' mindset is, I'm working really hard, I don't have time. I go, yeah, that's good, you're not doing Area 3 stuff. Yeah, but I don't have time. That's why you don't have time, because you're not doing Area 3 stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so that's what happens. So area four is where you're spending time management, managing of cash, managing of loans, bank statements, um, self-managed super funds, talking to bank people, paying off loans, managing uh, debts. But it's where you're not just paying bills. Paying bills in a business is kind of area one. It's when you're doing things more significant than just paying regular bills. That's called cash management. And then area five is investments, which is property, franchising, and those two typically, those sort of things. It's the real big stuff that you spend an hour and you go and make 50 or or $100,000 for one hour or two hours worth of work. You sign a contract, buy a property, yeah, that looks good, thanks. And then the thing goes up, you sell it, and you make a couple hundred grand. That's area five stuff. Area three is where you get paid over and 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 over because you did some work once. Now, you may have done work for three months. A lot of people I know in business will spend three to six months building a system don't make a cent for six months and then they launch and then they go exponential growth because they did all the work initially and they got no money for it, made nothing out of it, but they did the area three before they launched and so therefore they grew exponentially and lots of time available because they did the systems before that. And then you got area four which is like cash management where you learn about uh, trading and then you go and do some trades, you, you make a lot more money than what you would if you're working in area one. So area one is what our society teaches is really, really important. You've got to work really hard, got to work hard, got to work hard. Oh, I don't have any time, I don't have any time. Area one is busyness. Area one is just swimming with lead shoes on, you just drown. People retire broke and they work hard all their life in area one. Whereas if you talk about Richard Branson, Richard Branson doesn't have an area one. Any entrepreneur does not say, I'm too busy, I haven't got time, because that's what people in area one mindset talk like. Area three people mindset, area five people mindset, area four people mindset do not talk the same way at all. The whole language structure, their thoughts, their self-talk, everything they do, all their activities are radically different because they're entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs typically live in area three. Some that are right into property live in area five. Their business is area three. 
or their business is area three, some full-time traders live in area four. But entrepreneurs don't have an area one activity where if they don't work, they don't get paid. That That's not relevant for them. So this is very powerful for you to get some insights about what's going on in your own life. And the next one is, well, question, where are you most focused in life? And if you think, I've got to get more qualified, I've got to go and do another course, I've got to get trained better, all that thinking is area one. Instead of saying, I know enough, I've got to go and state market making money, I know too much already, I'm already doing stuff I should have paid someone to do years ago. Yeah, that's because you're still in area one thinking from our society's teaching that we've got to get more qualified, we've got to learn more. And all of our ideas go into area one instead of area three, four, and five. All right, let's look at this at a little bit more advanced level because what I'm going to do is show you the five circles. We're going to throw some lines in here. Now, when entrepreneurs get this thing humming, they might do a little bit in area one. They might do a little bit of, they might do a day a week. They might do, they might have a regular sort of hourly rate kind of job thing, but it's not full time. It's a part time role in their business. It might be, yeah, a couple of hours a week I talk to my general manager. That's my job because I talk to them for a couple of hours a week. Area three is where we start getting into ideas of leveraged income, where you get an, oh, there's an idea. Gee, if I did that once, wow, I can make a lot of money. Oh, that's worthwhile. Let's go and do it. So it's where your ideas go straight into area three, where you do something once and you love doing things once. Then you don't have to do it again. It's done. I love building PowerPoints. Why? Build it once, done, finish, go make money. Don't, don't keep playing with it forever. Finish it, done, go make money. You can put ideas into your cash management and you can put ideas straight into Area 5 where you set up JV partnerships or you go and buy properties or whatever it is that you do. But as you start to develop better relationships with your money in Area 4, you start to develop leverage income, which is simply interest on money. And as you start to save some money and develop that leverage income, you save a bit more, then allows some of your ideas from leverage income to go into property and you start being creative with ideas, area three, and start playing around with property. Now, when you start to make real money is when you join areas four and five, because what you're doing is saving money, area four, uh, saving up, you go and buy an investment that throws off cash flow. No, it doesn't cost you money, it kind of throws off cash flow. Then, as it throws off more cash flow, you save a bit more, then you go and buy an investment, then you save a bit more, go and buy an investment. Money makes money. You don't have to make money, money makes you money. So how are we going, people? How are you finding that subject? Because this is one of the ones that I find is quite challenging for a lot of people when I talk about this subject. They can be, whoa, that's a lot to get my head around. How are you finding that? Did you find it interesting? All right, you're liking it. That's good. Any other thoughts? It's a good way of thinking. It's something I've glossed over this bit. So I'm just giving you exposure to a lot of ways that I think as an entrepreneur. And this is how my brain kind of works. Area three, area three, area three. Now, go back, I don't know, eight years ago, it took me a while to even grasp what area three was about. Now, love it. I live in area three. I live there. In fact, I find it really hard to do area one because <laughs> I, I love area three so much. You get a taste for it. It's freaking awesome. But most people don't get enough taste to get addicted to it. They don't love it because they don't have time for them too busy. So that's why. All right. Let's continue on. Here's a bit about mindset, personality, and focus. So your mindset is, makes up your personality and that determines your focus. Now, the way your brain is wired, you can be very left brain dominant or very right brain dominant. Our society thinks left brain is king. You have to be great with your left brain. And all those kind of weird people are those right brain ones. But funny enough, they're the entrepreneurs. Now, the left brain people in our society tend to focus on avoiding mistakes. We can't make mistakes. We've got to get it right. We've got to plan, 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 plan. Don't just jump in, just plan. You've got to have a lot of plans in place before you start anything. And what's the cost going to be? And gee, that's a lot of risk. Or have you measured the risk? Have you calculated the risk? We need to really think about what the risk may be. And you've got to know how to do it properly. You've got to do it right. And where's the proof? Where's the proof? I can't believe you. Where's the facts? Where's the figures? I've got to see the proof before I can believe anything you say. So this is left brain thinking in our society. Right brain don't think about mistakes, they just think, well, I've got to achieve an outcome. Yeah, it's not perfect, doesn't matter, but at least I'm achieving instead of not starting because I'm worried about getting it perfect before I start. They just say, get it done, let's get it done. Because entrepreneurs let the left brain people, which is the majority of people in our society, worry about getting it right, they just want to get it done. They tend to take action so they learn. 
what are you doing? I don't know. I'm just going to jump in. I'm going to give it a go so I can learn some things. But you don't have a plan. Yeah, I know. My plan is action. <laughs> That's my plan. Take action so I can learn. And then I learn more from action. Not theoretical. I learn. Planning is purely theoretical. Before Optus came into Australia, Optus spent two years with 200 people, imagine the cost of that, to develop a business plan before they launched. And I listened to the CEO describing this just after Optus launched in Australia. 200 people, the smartest people I could find, high paid, let's do a business plan before we launch in Australia. And he said, six months after we started, half the plan was completely irrelevant. That's planning. All plans are theoretical. Action is pure experience. That's how you really learn. Entrepreneurs start thinking about benefit. The first thing they want to hear is they listen to people and go, benefit, benefit, profit, profit. Mm, that sounds good. Whereas most people go, oh, you want to sell me something. How much does it cost? Oh, that's a lot of money. And they don't even think about benefit. They don't even think about profit. Their first question is how much does it cost? They're not thinking risk. They're thinking reward. They don't see risk. Where others see risk, they see opportunity. They don't worry about knowing how. They delegate that stuff because there's lots of people that are specialists and they're a generalist. So they don't worry about the know-how. And they trust people. Whereas the people left brain dominant, which is your typical business owners, they want proof. And they don't believe it. And the more you've got to prove it to them, the less likely they are to ever succeed. So this is a whole mindset as well. I found that the right brainers, the entrepreneurs of the world, they grasp concepts. They grasp essence. They see the big picture, they see the vision, but the left brain is so busy analyzing details, they just don't see the forest for the trees. They're not seeing the big picture, they're stuck on process, not outcome. So this is an example of mindset as well. The major mindset differences, entrepreneurs explore every opportunity pretty much with a positive open mind. They're looking for the positive, whereas most people are looking to fault find as soon as someone says something. Yeah, so the entrepreneurs uh, haven't seen any errors in anything I've talked about or they haven't seen the um, typos. I don't even know if I got them. That's pretty good for me. But the people that um, aren't the entrepreneurs, they'll be finding everything I've said so far and dwelling on the 2% or 5% that what I've said isn't perfect and the way I've said it isn't right. And they'll be dwelling on that. The entrepreneurs will just be grasping the essence of what I'm saying. Go, keep talking, keep talking. This sounds good. That's just an example of mindset as well. Fear never clouds the judgment of an entrepreneur. They don't tend to have fear. If they make a mistake, it's not a mistake. It's a learning experience. Oh, excellent. I just learned how not to do it. Fantastic. They look for the benefit and profit first. That's the first thing they're looking for. They go, keep talking. What, what are you offering? Keep talking. What's the benefit of that? What's it going to do for me? Okay. Keep clarifying. Oh, now I've clarified. Yeah, okay. I see the profit in that. That sounds good. Excellent. Then they ask the cost after they see the benefit, not cost first and then find lots of reasons not to do it because they're dwelling on the details that actually cost money to achieve things in life. All entrepreneurs see it as an investment. Even when they have failures, that's an investment of my time to learn how not to do it. So there's a big difference between the two. And, uh, and entrepreneurs think about value. What's the value that you're contributing? And what's my ROI, return of and return on my investment? That's the way they're thinking. And they tend to make their own decisions and they look for opportunities everywhere. They don't tend to say, well, I've got to talk to so-and-so about that. They, they gather information. They have advisors, but they don't take advice. Now, there's a difference. If I advise you to do something, it's like me saying, I don't care what you say. You need to do it. You must do it. Just go and do it. That's like me giving you advice. Whereas I say, have you thought about doing this? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, that's a good idea. Well, what do you think would happen if you did it? Oh, yeah, I can see a benefit. All right, so what are you going to do? Oh, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it. That sounds like a good idea. So that's an example versus giving advice versus making people aware of things. So entrepreneurs treat their advisors not as advisors to tell me what to do. In fact, sometimes they do the complete opposite of what their advisors do because they don't. They listen to advisors and then they go and do their own thing anyway. And I kind of upset <laughs> some of the people in my family because I go and say, what do you think of this? And then they tell me and I go, oh, okay, thanks. And then I do the opposite of what they say and they get really upset with me. I go, look, I'm sorry. I make my own decisions. So even though I ask for your feedback, I still make my own decisions. And that can upset some people because that's kind of how entrepreneurs are. And they look for opportunities everywhere. What entrepreneurs never say, I'm too busy. 
and I don't have any time. I've never ever heard an entrepreneur ever say, I'm too busy, I don't have any time. They never say it. They never say, I don't have any money. They might say, I'm a bit short on cash right now, or right now I can't, but in the future I will, but they never say, I don't have any money. These are like lies. If you say, I don't have any time, that's actually a lie. I don't have any money. You got a dollar? Good. Well, then it's a lie. So they don't say these things to themselves. You won't hear them saying these words. Why did you tell me to do that? You'll never hear an entrepreneur say, why did you tell me to do that? Because they don't go by what someone tells them what to do ever. They always make their own decision. They don't, these words, should. Oh, I should do that. Oh, yeah, I shouldn't. No, I shouldn't do that. I should. They don't should on themselves. They're very definite with their language structures. They'll never say, that person told me to. Whereas I've met people say, well, that person told me to. Well, okay. Well, why'd you do it? Well, because they told me to. Well, why do you do what people tell you to? We've all heard that growing up as children. So as adults, it should be something we outgrow. That won't work. You know, the easiest thing to find in the world is the person will tell you that won't work. It's the easiest thing in the world. You can't do that. That's impossible. No, you can't do that. I hear that constantly with some of the testimonials I put in the mark. No, that's hard to believe. I can't believe it. Okay, just because you can't believe it doesn't mean it's true. So a lot of the time, that's what's happening. That's too risky. You'll never hear an entrepreneur saying that's too risky. They get curious when people say that's too risky. Oh, there's too much risk in that. They go, sorry, what did you say? I'm, I'm hearing an opportunity there. What did you say? Can you, can you go over that a bit more? <laughs> they get attracted to what people call risky. In my opinion, which is a popular phrase, in my opinion, I think you rarely ever, if ever, hear an, uh, an entrepreneur say, in my opinion, because they realize opinions, there's not much substance in opinions. So what do you say? Of course you don't say any of these things. I'm sure you don't say any of these things. But I'd like you to become more aware of what it is that you do say. Every now and again I catch myself saying I should. No, I must. So I catch myself mid-sentence now because it's a common phrase now. So I should, do, no, I must. Am I going to do it or am I not going to do it? So I go into question mode. If I should, I must. So am I going to do it or am I not going to do it? Okay, let's not do it, but I'm going to put it in my account. I'm going to revisit doing it in a month's time. But I don't should on myself. So people should, 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 yeah, should try, yeah, try, try, should try that, yeah, might, might, might. Their language is vague. You don't hear this vague language structure from entrepreneurs. Let's talk about how you see opportunities. You see opportunities with your mind, not with your eyes. I love finding skeptics, especially when I find a whole bunch of them, because when I find a whole lot of skeptics all saying the same thing, I go, hmm, what's the opposite of what they're saying? I better go and investigate. Has anyone ever met a rich skeptic? I've never met a rich skeptic, never met a wealthy skeptic. In fact, nearly every skeptic I've ever met is um, quite the opposite. They're so busy airing their opinions, but they're not coming from pure experience. So it's not being open-minded to be skeptical of things. Yeah, Skepticism to me is one step off fear. It's just you're just worried about having experiences is what skeptics are like. So that's a way to start finding opportunities in the marketplace. Listen, when everyone says, and I mean everyone, everyone, almost everyone in the industry here, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, and they're right there. Look for opportunities when someone says everyone. When you say, but everyone does this. I hear this constantly from business owners. I say, why don't you do this? But everyone in our industry does that. I go, yeah, that didn't really answer my question. Why aren't you doing this? And it sort of shocks me. Well, no one does that. Okay. Well, good. Let me explain why I'm saying that to you. And then I explain. I go, wow, no one does that. I say, can you understand what I'm saying now? Yeah, I really understand what you're saying. Good. Well, let's go and do it. It's a different way of thinking. I look for when lots of people say everyone does that. What do businesses fear to do? Lots of businesses fear to do lots of things. A lot of businesses fear guarantees. I've been teaching hundreds and hundreds of business owners to write in their yellow pages ads and all their advertising, guaranteed to turn up on time. If you're a trader, guaranteed to turn up on time. You'll pay 50 bucks if you're late. Business owners go, I can't do that. I go, why? Well, I'm late too often. I go, oh, so you think it's okay to let people down and you think you're still going to win a job when you let people down and think that's okay. That's interesting. So why aren't you paying people for the inconvenience of letting them down and then maybe they'll forgive you and then they'll let you do your pitch or your sales proposal or quote and then they may still buy from you. But that's an example of the fear that people have. Businesses fear saying things like that. 
Mass fear and frustrations in people creates opportunities. When there's fear, there's opportunity. When there's frustration, there's opportunity. People buy based on emotion. So where there are strong emotions, there is always opportunities. I've learned a lot about Facebook in the last six months, and they say find a subject people are passionate about. When you find passion, you find opportunity. And it's a very, very powerful principle. So what's the fear in your target market, your type of audience? What are the frustrations that they have? What are the concerns they have? What are they excited by? You tap into these emotions, you find opportunities to make money. It's a very simple principle. An entrepreneurial friend of mine taught me years ago when I was hmm, about 28, I suppose. Yeah, about 28, 27, 28. And he said, look, I figured out, encourage people to be lazy and then charge them for it. <laughs> I love the concept. So if you look at how many businesses, and there would be hundreds, actually work on this principle. If you go back 40 years, could you get someone to deliver food to your home? Could you get someone to come and mow your lawn for you? Could you get someone to clean your pool for you, do your washing, do your ironing, um, and do all the stuff that delivers straight to your packages get delivered to your home? You look at how many industries now tapped into this. Don't you do it. We'll do it for you. Here's the price. Good, thanks. I don't want to know about it. Thanks for that. Yep, I'll pay. This is a very powerful entrepreneurial principle as well. And we're moving more into this done for you. You haven't got to do it. It's already done. There it is. It's done. Oh, cool. Because our society, people don't want to think. They just want to let someone else take, okay, take away all their challenges, all their problems. Can you just take care of it all for me? Because I don't want to have to do it. We're a lazy society. So therefore, you can tap into that. Be expensive is a great opportunity. Very few businesses say, gee, there's only one mega expensive person in my industry. Oh, look, there's no one. Wow, what an opportunity because there are people that say, if you're not expensive, you must be crap. Look at how many very expensive exclusive things there are in the world. The world's most expensive and highest paid and you know, most successful dentist in the world lived in uh, Brisbane. And he worked on average two days a week and made more money. He made four times more than the average dentist by working two days a week. And he was expensive. He was super exclusive. He had a silent phone number. You couldn't even ring him because he had a silent number. The only way you could find out about him even was by referral alone. You couldn't get to him unless you came by referral. He had a silent phone number. And he didn't even have a sign at the front. You couldn't walk in off the street. He had no signage and a silent phone number. You couldn't go to him. That's pretty exclusive. And it's a very interesting story, Dr. Paddy Lund, P-A-D-I-L-U-N-D, Dr. Paddy Lund, that was him. So that's an example where how many people are doing this? Almost none in any industry. How big is the opportunity then if no one is typically doing it in any industry? It's pretty huge. So have you learned some things from this slide? Have you started going, wow, I'm starting to think a bit differently? Yeah, I hear what you're saying. You're starting to see some opportunities in your own industry yet, some ways of thinking that maybe you haven't seen before. Taking some notes. It's very quiet out there. What's happening? What are you thinking? Give me some text messages. I'd like to hear from you. You start to think, hmm, maybe I could put my price up. Maybe I could be more expensive. I had a client of mine in Sydney who's in the tree service industry, and if he went out and did a quote, and he'd follow up and he'd say, well, um, who's more expensive? Um, no, that's right. He'd do a quote. And then he'd follow up uh, like a week later and say, how'd you go? When did you do your quotes? And um, I had you go with the quotes. You get any other quotes? Yeah, yeah, we got one. And oh, I had a mine compare. Oh, they were more expensive than you. He'd, he's like, oh, damn, that's no good. I've got to put my prices up. <laughs> That's the complete opposite to what most business owners do. So, like, gee, someone's more expensive. That's no good. I'm not the most expensive. I've got to charge more. So he put his prices up. I don't, he's the only client I've ever met that thinks that way, that I'm, someone can't be more expensive than me. If I want to be the most exclusive and the best, I've got to charge more. Most people do the complete opposite. When it's recession time, his prices go up because he's getting less sales, so he wants to maintain the profits. Prices go up and he gets better at selling. So, yeah. All right, let's get going. 
three, three entrepreneurial skills in business. This is what I train business owners on intensively for three months. The first one is people skills. Entrepreneurs tend to have pretty good people skills because they trust people. Most people don't trust anyone with anything and don't reveal much about themselves. So trust is something that you need to learn and develop. There's usually a bunch of fear or bad experiences and mindset people have in business. That's why they end up doing it all themselves because they don't trust people to do it right. I've got to do it. And that is a trap and it's something I've been trapped with myself and because I've been trapped with it myself and every now and again I get trapped by it, I go, oh, yep, I'm seeing it, good. That means I'm relatable to every business owner that I work because it's a very big trap. Second one is measuring skills. You've got to become exceptional with numbers and most people don't like numbers. They don't love spreadsheets and as I like to say, if you don't love spreadsheets, you're not living. You're missing out. And the third thing you've got to become exceptional at is systems. But there's some real synergy between these. But people go, well, 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 hang on, if I want to be a successful business, don't I need to know all about my industry? I go, no, that's your self-employed or employee mindset talking, not entrepreneur. There are people that are exceptional at these three skills, and when you combine all three, some people can have good people skills, but they don't combine it with measuring skills. So when you measure people, you create accountability. When you create accountability, you create performance and people perform more when they have to, when they're accountable and numbers never lie. So they look at a number and go, oh, sorry boss, yeah, I didn't have a, yeah, that number's not good, I didn't perform very well. So that creates accountability, creates that pressure on them. When you measure, you start to realize the obviousness of systems. Gee, I really need systems, wow. Yeah, the number, look at the numbers, gee, I really need systems. And when you put systems in place, you make people accountable. So the arrow goes from systems to people, makes people accountable. The people, when you measure, start to recognize they need systems and if they get involved at all with creation of the systems, they love the systems that they help to co-create, therefore they use the systems. And when you are putting systems in place, you need to know if it worked or not because you measure it to find out. And when you are measuring, then people perform better as a result and people need to be involved in measuring so that therefore you can identify the systems. There's beautiful synergy in all these three things. And to me, this is becoming a master of business. A master of business and becoming a super entrepreneur is synergizing all three skills. Now, under the heading of people, there's a big subject which I won't go into. Under the heading of measuring, that's a really big subject I won't go into. And under systems, that's a really big subject as well. There are so many things under those headings, but because I'm not going to go into details, I'm talking entrepreneurs, these are the three skill sets that you need to focus on in business. Now, most people in business are not developing these three skill sets. They really don't see it. They, they dabble a bit in systems, but then they go and get people to use them, and then you get frustrated, and rarely are they measuring. And the order of implementation of these three skills, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the webinar, but there is a specific implementation order. If you try and do one out of order, you'll get a lot of resistance and it won't be integrated into the business. So that's something we'll talk about a little bit later. So learning these skills turns self-employment <coughs> excuse me, into business ownership. <coughs> When you put these skills into a business, you can turn your <clears throat> busyness, if you like, if you're one of those very busy people, into a business that runs completely without you or in part without you. That's the outcome of applying these three skills. All right, so the trap of business growth. Hey, I'm curious. I sent you a um, reminder video before you came onto this. Can you give me a yes or a no if you watched the reminder video? I only sent it out an hour or two ago. Just let me know if you watched that video at all. I'm curious to know if you did. Send me a little message there, you have, good, let's have a look. I, I think it most, most of you wouldn't, yeah, so unfortunately most of you didn't. All right, what happens in business? This is something that a lot of people go, I need to grow my business, I need more customers, I need more customers, and they keep thinking this way for quite a long period of time, and they might have increased their turnover from half a mil to two, two million dollars over the period of time, period of few years, doesn't matter what the time frame is, but let's say the business has grown. So they're saying business is good, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing, and look, my net profits are up, I talk to my accountant at the end of the year, my net profit has increased and it keeps increasing every year, business is great, business is great, this is good, I've got to keep growing my business, I need more customers, keep growing, grow, market, market. What they're not seeing is the percentage. Now the real magic of business is understanding ratios and ratios are about a relationship between two numbers and that is a percentage. The percentage, which is the net profit margin, is the 75K divided by 500K is 15% and the 7.5% is the 150 divided by the 2 million. 
that's what's happening in this business. So what's trending is the net profit margin is going down, 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 which means if this business keeps doing this, what's going to happen? Well, they're going to run out of money. Now, I had a client, a really good example, that they went from 8 million turnover with an 8% net margin to 20 million turnover with a 3% net margin, and then I met them. <laughs> so I said, you guys keep it up, you're going to go broke. They go, we are, we're running out of cash. Now, cash flow is typically, not always, but the majority of times a symptom, not the cause, it's a symptom of a low net profit margin. So people go, I need to improve my cash flow. I go, no, you need to increase your net profit margin. That's why you don't have money. Because if your net profit margin is 5%, if you get paid $1,000, it's like every cost of your whole business has to come out of proportionally every sale, because that's what pays the bills is the sales. And if it's 5%, you get $1,000, that means $950 is gone straight out of your bank account, and you're left with 50 bucks. That's why, you don't have a, that's why you have a cash flow problem because there's no money in the bank after you paid everything out of the cost of running your business out of the sale. So therefore, it looks like you've got a cash flow problem when really it's a net profit margin. Now, that's not always the case, but this is something that business owners don't get taught. They're not taught that net profit margins are the number one reason why businesses don't have any time because they can't afford to pay the extra people to free up the time. Then they can focus on marketing with a lot of money in the bank and then really crank the business up. That's something I like to share with business owners because no one's really telling business owners this stuff and they really, really need to know it, that marketing should not be your only focus. Here's an example. Look, this is a <coughs> screenshot taken from that website below and it's telling you the, the benchmarks, which is an average for an industry, of different industries and what that net profit margin is. So look at this, other manufacturing for a business that's turning over 500k to 750k, the average benchmark net margin for the industry, 2%. Gee, if they go to 1.1 million to 5 million, gee, they're making three. Cafes, 500,000 to 750, 5%. One to 5 million, 2%. Motor vehicle retailing and services, hmm, 5%. Ah, net margin's going down with turnover. Personal and household retailing, looks all right. Until they cracked a million, gone from 10 down to 2. Personal services, 7 down to 4. 90% of businesses from my research, which is pretty extensive, are running with less than 10% net margin. And they're the ones that keep telling me they need more marketing. And I'm saying, your net margin's low. You don't need more marketing. If you're at that half mil, three quarters of a mil, marketing should not be your major focus now. Getting your net margin up higher is what you need to have. Increasing your net margin is what I call free money because you don't have to spend money to have it in your bank. You don't have to spend a lot of money to do anything. I've had clients that have massively increased profits without getting any more customers, without employing any more staff, because that's the power of the concept. Who'd like to learn the best strategy to get free money? Would you like to know what the best strategy is? Well, there's a few of them. <clears throat> Here it is. This is the number one. Put your prices up 10% on Monday. 90% of businesses are too cheap. That's why the net margin is too low. They need to raise their prices and they haven't even thought about that. They're too cheap because when people go into business, they're unaware of all the costs of running a business. They're unaware of the expenses their business is incurring and they think that the previous boss made a lot of money so I don't have to have all those overheads. I can be cheaper than them and that's typically how most businesses start, not all. But most businesses start too cheap and then they incur some costs, they put the price up a bit. They, so it's only by reaction that they, they keep thinking, oh, I can't afford to run, I'm going to have to put my prices up. And then they sometimes hit the barrier of, well, now my price is up, I'm starting to not win sales. Ugh. And then they get in this mindset that they can't charge more or they don't get sales, so they're not actually making any money, so therefore it must be a cash flow problem. If I get more marketing, that'll solve my problem. But as we saw... What happens with businesses when they grow? Well, the majority here, net margins are decreasing as they grow. Now, some of the benchmarking stats actually show some companies running at 0% net margin. Benchmark, which is average of a lot of businesses. So this is a scary subject. So, question for you. Are you brave enough? Because it takes a lot of courage to put your price up, 10%. And the number one reason why business owners won't do it is fear. And how do you overcome fear? You need courage. 
And that's what I help business owners to do. I help people to see the reason and the logic and the persuasion of what I do. I spend, I've spent an hour and a half with the business owner just convincing them to put the price up an hour and a half. And one business I did this with, they're a wholesaler and they're dealing with 180 of the exactly the same customers every single week. They actually never generated any more customers. They're a wholesaler. And they had 180 and every single week they supplied those 180. And they, they had one lead a year or to a year, everything was purely sell this product range to these customers. So when I talked about a price rise, they were terrified. Oh no, I'm going to lose so many customers. I can't do it. I pulled out my spreadsheet, showed them some mass, talked about um, profit versus turnover, showed them some ratios. They, an hour and a half later, they, they believed me they need to put them up 10%. They did and they lost zero customers. And yet when they first came near the subject, they were convinced they were going to lose like half the customers or something. Now that conversation for an hour and a half made them 220,000 net profit. That's what I made them for an hour and a half of my time. I think they were pretty happy with that. In fact, they were. <laughs> That's an example of the power of information. All right, so what's your business's net profit margin? If your turnover is over 750K and your net margin is under 15%, get some training on how to increase it because to me 15% is the minimum you want to trade with and I'd be surprised if anyone has ever been told what net margin they need to trade at minimum and minimum turnover because see your net margin is typically a lot higher when it's under 750k, 750k is where you get a couple of admin people and yeah you need to rent a premises and you got a couple of vehicles and insurance and a whole lot of other basic expenses kick into a business at that size, so therefore net margins can look pretty high. At 200,000 is probably 50% for some businesses, so, oh my net margin's huge, I don't need your training, well, okay, come back and see me when it's 750k, we'll have a chat. Um, and it's often dropping like a rock. So I see a lot of businesses under 10, I see some at 15, I see some at 20. I've got clients that have gone from 6 to 18 in four months, and their sales have increased even though their net margin is tripled. So this is what training can do on this subject. And I recommend you be very, very focused on increasing net margin before you do any more marketing because you can't afford to do really good marketing. Because so I talked to some really smart marketers and the biggest thing is they can't afford me. They can't afford me. They can't afford me. I go, yeah, because they go with crappy marketers because they can afford them. And then they wonder why it doesn't work and they're still not working because this is what happens. So you, you need to do this. You need to, before you do any marketing, get your net margin up. If you're at 750K or higher, start focusing on margins. And that comes from management training and entrepreneurial thinking. It doesn't come from technical skills from an industry. It's got nothing to do with margins, zero. In fact, technical skills are anti-margins in a way because you think you have to do it yourself because you're really good at doing what you're doing. That's not margin thinking. That's employee thinking. It's got nothing to do with making money not as a business. All right, so then you'll make a fortune. Now, I've had clients increase prices 30 or 40% and maintain sales. And as I talked to you at the start of this webinar, I had a client this morning that I'd been out with on sales calls and she got four sales acceptances this week and, and some last week. And I've only been out with her on four appointments. She's won three and she said, two or three of them are all 2,000 or almost double the price of her competitors because I'm teaching her how to sell and how to present herself in a way that makes people love parting with money happily and no complaints whatsoever. So that this is an example of the training you can get that achieves these outcomes. Now I've given you a book on this subject of net margins. Um, that was in the link of your registration for the webinar. I don't know if anyone has had a look at it, but this book is highly educational because it's all about you becoming very familiar with this whole subject net margins and entrepreneurs love margins. Business owners think turnover, sales, I need more sales. Whereas entrepreneurs think margins, I need to make margin. Because that's what pays the overheads. If I don't have net profit, which is net profit margin, I can't pay bills, I can't get my ROI. So what's the margin of your business? So it's something that I'd like you to really have a think about, have a real study, is to start studying that book, read it twice, ingrain this thinking into your mind because this is not common thinking at all. Uh, most business owners I talk to, I said, has anyone talked to you about net profit margins and how to increase it and what you need to be? And I haven't had one business owner say yes to those questions, not one. Almost no one talks about this subject in the global community, which I kind of find interesting and amazing. And an opportunity. <laughs> it's an opportunity for me because no one's talking about it. Good. If no one's doing it, great. Time for me to jump in. 
All right, so what happens in businesses is this is net margin entrepreneurial thinking. Think of your business as like a big bucket. It's like a bucket of water and it's got some leaks. And what's happening is that there are inquiries coming into your business. It's like water coming into your bucket. And after your business has done all that work, then there's some profit. There's a small bucket called profit. So you have big bucket turnover, small bucket profit. So if it's 10%, then the small bucket's 10% of the size of the big bucket. Now what most business owners are saying is, can you help me put more water in my bucket? I need my phone to ring. I need more customers. And it's typically more customers means lead generation. They don't think conversion rate. They don't go and get sales training. They're typically thinking, I need more leads. Can you make my phone ring? And so they're thinking inquiries. Whereas entrepreneurs don't think this way. They think, well, hang on, look at all the leaks I've got. Why don't I plug some holes? So you, you go and plug a hole. And there's so many different holes that businesses had. But what happens in this business, if you go and plug, if this is a real live situation and that was water overflowing and we went and plugged a whole bunch of these holes, wow, we're going to have some profits in this business. And that's what I'm teaching business owners. So the lower your percentage, the bigger the holes and the more leaks you've got in your business. The higher your net margin, the less leaks that you've got. You're always going to have a cost to sale. You're always going to have some expenses, but it's really about getting that net margin up. So here's some examples of profit leaks. So a lot of business owners spend a fortune on advertising and they don't focus on getting free inquiries. There are many, many, many ways to get free inquiries leveraged where you put a bit of time in, you've got an automated way of generating leads for your business ongoing. Almost no businesses focus on leveraged lead generation which costs nothing but time. They don't want to learn. They just pay someone to do it for them and assume that what they're paying works and they don't even measure it and they don't know. So a lot of money gets lost in this low conversion rate. So it's where you're paying people to talk to people, but because they're not converting many because they've never been trained in sales, their conversion rates are poor. And because their conversion rates are poor, your profits are leaking from, you might have a 20% conversion rate. And whatever it is, it's always lower than what you assume. You don't assume conversion rates, you measure them. How many people do you talk to? How many buy? Quantify it, measure it every week. Majority of business owners are under 30% in their marketplace and nearly all those same business owners think they're 50%. Now, if it's at 30%, it means you're paying 100% of the wages for a person that's actually making your money 30% of the time. That hurts net margins. If you can take it to 50, 60%, then you're not. Now, I've got clients that are running at 65% conversion rate, and they're not cheap. They're not the most expensive, but they're definitely in the middle, if not higher. Their net margins are pretty good, and yet they're running over 60% on average dollar sales of $12,000. So which means they're winning two-thirds of the quotes virtually for people that would probably get three or four quotes and they're already one of the most expensive in the industry. I've got a bathroom renovator who is probably the most expensive. His, convert, his net margin is 22% and he's 22% net margin. He's running it at a 62, 65% conversion rate, 55 sometimes, but it's in that over 50%. And he's running a 22 net margin, which means he's probably the most expensive going out there. But his service and his quality is exceptional, and that's what people want to buy. They want to buy that peace of mind, that exceptional quality. So this is an example where net margins are affected directly by activity that is not making money. So that hurts net margins. Rarely do business owners have a pricing system where labor is included as a cost of sale for service and manufacturing businesses. That is such a rare thing. Less than one in a thousand business owners actually have a system which is a spreadsheet or a proper digital way of pricing based on a gross net profit margin. It's typically a, have a guess. That sounds good. There's some of my costs. That's it. Few documented systems. There's not much documentation. There's a lot in people's heads. Ineffective marketing. I call it abdication of learning because they don't want to learn. They just pay someone to do it all the time and assume that they're doing a good job. They don't learn anything themselves. They're not proactively training their team. They're reactively training their team, which means that the team members never really learn, which means they got all these people running around a support crew, but the business owner is always busy because they're too smart. Instead of being a great teacher, they're focused on how smart they are as against how good they are at teaching. You learn how to teach people, proactively train your team, you free up time and it makes you a lot of money. Inconsistency of production. A lot of businesses have huge inconsistencies. Uh, we've all been customers of businesses that will let us down. Yeah, That's an example of the inconsistencies. Not having any integrity with customers, so which means yes, 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 we're going to do this, we're going to do this and I'll be there at 4 and then we turn up at 5.30. Or, oh, sorry, I couldn't get there and um, oh, this happened and tell them a story and they think it's okay to let people down. 
um, not delivering on what you say you will. That's a lack of integrity and that hurts your business because customers tell people who tell people who tell people and next thing you got no customers. Not enough measuring. Um, business owners think the P&L is the best management tool there is. I think it's a good tool. I certainly don't think it's anywhere near the best because it doesn't tell you which jobs you made money on, which ones you didn't. didn't tell you your conversion rate. didn't tell you where you're leaking a lot of profits. It's a good tool, yes, but it doesn't tell you enough about measuring, but it's a good tool. No staff KPIs for accountability. So you can't look at an employee's week by a number and say, gee, they've had a good week, look at that number. They just got to supervise them and check on them and things like that because there's not enough numbers. And a lot of assumptions and hope. Gee, I hope that's going to work and I'm hoping that's the right price and I hope this is, there's so much assumption that I assume that my conversion rates are high. I assume that all my employees are all working hard. I assume my prices are making me profit. I assume everything I sell makes me a profit. I assume my marketing works. There's so many assumptions that business owners have because they're not measuring and that's huge profit leaks, all these different areas that business owners aren't measuring. All right. So have you been learning some things that I've been talking about as far as the subject of net margin and the way that businesses operate inefficiently because they're not doing a lot of these things? Have I started to expand your mind a little bit? Are you starting to think a little bit differently? Because net margins is sometimes a little bit hard to grasp as a concept. It takes a little bit of learning to get your head around and it's something that it's fairly foreign as a concept. And, and I've been to Eagle Street Brisbane to big accounting firms, 13 partners and you know, thousands of clients and I've started talking about net margins and sometimes they don't know what I'm talking about. I've looked at their face and gone, hmm, this is not a familiar conversation that they've had with people. It's not a new, it's a new conversation for the majority of people in the world when they're in business. So unfortunately, that's just where we are. So this can be challenging because new things are challenging and I kind of did give you that warning when we started. All right, very good, let's get going. So I want to talk about what I consider the world's best marketing strategy and I call it something that's a bit more simple and understandable. It's actually strategic alliances, but that's kind of confusing because then people say, what's the difference between a strategic alliance and a host beneficiary? And if you're familiar with those two concepts, great, but this is something that's going to make it a little bit simpler to understand. So when you're in business, you want to get lots of hot prospects, yeah? And I don't mean prospects, I mean hot prospects, people that are kind of warmed up and being introduced to your business by someone else. doesn't get any better than that. It's like referrals are the, by far the best type of person you can get contacting your business because another customer has told you how great they are, told you what the cost is, how much they paid for it, and they're already informed and they're still contacting you. Excellent. You will get great conversion rates for referrals. Now I've been measuring conversion rates of hundreds and hundreds of businesses for 16 years. I know which is the best conversion rate. Referrals are the best by far. I commonly see 70% plus. The next best is from what I call strategic partners or complementary businesses. Ones that are similar but different similar industry or related industries and these other businesses are referring their clients to this business. So it's like you probably got this happening now where if you're a plumber then an electrician might refer people to you. If you're a mechanic then the car yard may refer work to you or something like that. I get a lot of referrals from accountants for example because they're a complementary business. Yes, there can be a slight overlap but this is the problem in our society. Where we see overlap, we see competition, that's a bad thing. Let's compete. Every man for himself. Whereas I say, no, 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 you've got to learn to work with people that complement you and focus on the 90% non-overlap and forget the 10% and just pretend it doesn't matter and it doesn't really matter and work a relationship with these people. So guess what? Most people in the world are kind of doing this ad hoc, but because they're kind of thinking area one, busy, 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 haven't got time for anything, I'll just spend money on marketing because I haven't got time to learn, I haven't got time to do all this stuff, well, that's why their net margins are typically low. But if you work with a complementary business, I call it 90 degree marketing because instead of going directly from your business to try and advertise to get prospects, you're going via someone else indirectly to them. I call it 90 degree marketing, that's why I call it that. So I've got to come up with a name that sounds more user friendly. So you're going to someone else. So I've had, a, I don't know, multiple means coming from my sales from referrals from complementary businesses, multiple millions over the years and nearly every single one of them cost me zero, not a thing, not a cent. 
or so low it's not funny, like a couple hundred bucks for me to make 20,000, that sort of thing. So that's an example of the power. So who likes the idea of making lots of money without spending any money? Getting lots of referrals forever for work you do once because this is a leveraged income activity. I get people referring work to me over and over and over and over and over and over and some of them I haven't seen for a couple of years, but I get lots of work because of a relationship. Uh, one of my stri major strategic partners, they email me and um, I get, you know, I get about 2,000 emails go out about an event that I run and they send out 2,000 emails, cost me nothing. Now, if I get a sale, I sometimes pay commission, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But put it this way, if I said you guaranteed sales $10,000, would you pay me $1,000 if I gave you guaranteed 10,000 sales and 10,000 sales and it costs you nothing unless I get you 10,000 in sales? An entrepreneur would say yes to that all day, every day. Most business owners hesitate. <laughs> That's the difference between entrepreneurs versus business owners. They say, 10%, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a thousand bucks. You give me 10 grand all day, every day. No problem. Just bring it on. Let's do it. Whereas most business owners, oh, that's a lot of money. Yeah, because they prefer to get 100% and not much. So this is a trap as well. You've got to be prepared to spend money to make money in business. Most people don't want to spend. So in this case, a complementary business becomes your strategic partner for mutual benefits. So I get referrals from other marketers. I get referrals from accounting firms. I get referrals from bookkeepers, um, printers. I've had referrals from printers. I've had referrals from IT companies. I have referrals from mortgage brokers. Because I work these relationships, I develop the relationships and I create mutual win-win advantages in our relationship. So most business owners got no idea how to do this. They don't have the people skills. They don't trust people. They're greedy. They don't want to pay anything. They couldn't be bothered. They haven't got time. And that's why people can't do some of the best strategies that I know until I really adjust their mindset. And this is something I talk about in step six after I've been through five other steps. So I've trained them, trained them, trained them, adjust their mindset, adjust their mindset. Now I can say, now I'll, maybe you're ready for me to teach this very advanced strategy because you've got to be a certain mindset before you can actually do it. And most people really never focus on it, never do it. So it's the best strategy in the world. You're kind of already doing it by accident but why aren't you proactively doing it? You already know that someone referring people to you is a great strategy, so why aren't you spending a day a week doing it? If you spend a day a week doing it, in six months you probably never have to spend a cent on marketing ever again. Is that worth something, you know, some time to do it? You make time to do the things that make you success in business. That's how entrepreneurs think. All right, so <clears throat> have more than one strategy. Too many businesses, I've got a website. <laughs> The old days ago, right, what sort of marketing strategies do you have? Well, I've got yellow pages. And I pause. <laughs> I'm not hearing any more. That's it. They've got kind of one great strategy, and it's all got to work on that. I say in business, you've got to build a path and on. It's a principle that's been around for a long while. So you need to develop strategic alliances. You need to develop your website. I've got a client that's got three websites. So who says you're only allowed to have one? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Well, I have more than one website. Facebook. Get into Facebook. And there's two sides. There's the, the static where, well, not the static, but there's the free side and there's the advertising side. Get into LinkedIn. LinkedIn is phenomenal for building strategic alliances and doing 90-degree marketing. It's the best platform in the world to do 90-degree marketing, yet almost no one does it. I met a guy the other day that um, has alliances all over Australia and New Zealand and he has a software program and he sells to business owners and I talked to him yesterday. He rang me out of the blue because we connected on LinkedIn and I started having a good chat and I'm like, wow, this could be worth a million dollars a year to me, this relationship from one phone call because I connected to him on LinkedIn. Is that worth connecting to people on LinkedIn? Oh, I would hope so. Google AdWords. YouTube, things like that. So you need to have a bunch of different strategies. These are kind of six that I would probably recommend you think about, whether you want to do Google AdWords or not, but definitely YouTube, definitely LinkedIn, definitely Facebook, definitely Facebook, a website, definitely strategic alliances, and then even a few after that. You need to get four to six really good lead sources because that irons out the, I'm really busy, oh, I've got no work. Oh, I'm really busy, Gee, it's quiet, and that roller coaster of busyness and not busy and worry and stress and all that sort of thing gets in the way of running a good business. So it's something I want you to think about too. Most businesses would benefit enormously if they had 50 to 100% more leads because when you get 50% and 100 more leads, you put your prices up, then you have big fat margins because you put your price up to scare off too many leads. So in business, you should be getting too many leads because then you can dictate what the prices are because you've got too many. You don't worry about not having enough. So that's an example. But 
if you can't afford the marketing, think about the free things, think about the leverage things, think about 90 degree marketing if you've got to build your leads. Always solutions, no matter what your situation business is, always strategy you can apply. All right, so let's review what we've talked about. Can you see from what I've talked about, how are you going there? Because I know some people get a little bit shell-shocked from some of the things I talk about. Sometimes people are like, whoa, man, that was a lot to digest. So tell me if you're feeling like a little bit overwhelmed. Tell me if you're like, bring it on, this is excellent. Tell me if you're like, yeah, yeah, I, I like the stuff you talked about. This is interesting stuff. Or you're just finding it a good learning experience. Give me some feedback on this if you wouldn't mind. But entrepreneurs think differently. That's what we talked about. We talked about mindset determines your success. So hopefully you've got some good exposure to some different ways of thinking, some outside the box ways of thinking where I'm showing you how to make a lot of money without spending a cent. Sales training makes you a fortune for money you spend once. I've had so many clients make so much money from teaching them sales. It's one of my best skills is to teach sales. You know, my record is an engineering company out of Toowoomba that eight salespeople come to my training and a month later they added $400,000 to their sales. I think that was a pretty good day's work for what they paid me. They paid me about, let me have a think, paid me about four grand. They made 400000 So as an entrepreneur, I think they probably got a pretty good ROI. But that's an example. So some of these things that are a bit challenging. You may find some of this stuff hard to believe. Um, that's okay. That's probably part of your mindset. It's where you are. Some people might go, yeah, I want exactly what you're talking about. I believe everything you're saying. I can't wait. So it just depends where you are. But mindset determines your success. I watch people in business fail because their mindset says, nah, you don't know what you do. Oh, my business is Nah, you can't help me. Nah, you're too expensive. And I watch them and they fail because their mindset makes them fail. They're just not receptive. They're not teachable. They can't learn. They're too skeptical. They're too scared. They're too worried. They're pessimistic. They don't trust. All these things is why they're not successful in business. We talked about three major skills to learn in business, which is people skills, measuring skills, system skills. We talked about doing what is uncommon. Go and find what's uncommon. I love meeting business owners that have a very unusual business and like hardly anyone's doing what they're doing. And I love that. It's like, go, good on you, entrepreneur, go for it. Everyone said it probably wouldn't work too and there you are powering along making money. I love talking to people like that. Doing what is in common leads to success. There's a massive six-lane highway to mediocrity. The path to success is a little dirt track hidden by bushes that you've got to slow right down for. And I teach my business owners, do you want to accelerate your success? They say, yep. I say, do less. Huh? Yeah, do less. <laughs> slow down. That's how you accelerate. You actually accelerate by doing less because you think more instead of being busy. So that's the principle. Have you received value today? Have you got some good stuff? Have you learned some things? What stood out for you? Let me have a look at read some of your comments. Good stuff to think about. That's good. Thought provoking. Excellent. Good. Um, Tiani got to head off soon. I'll send an email out soon. If you've got to leave early, I'll be sending an email follow up in this as well. If you like the free 50 minutes, now I've only just given you some really, really small basic stuff for 90 minutes. So if I've only just given you what I consider basic, because I don't give my best stuff for, for free. No one gives best stuff for free. I don't know anyone on the planet that gives the best stuff for free. Well, I can't because my best stuff blows some people out of the water. So I've got to start at a, you know introductory level too. But if you like what you got here for about 90 minutes, imagine how good other things are that I could talk to you about. So that's what I like to do. Would you like to learn more? If so, let me tell you a little bit more about what else I have. I've developed a seven step formula. Seven steps of business freedom I call them. It's going to go through a name change soon. It's going to be called the seven steps of business certainty because that's what it does. It gives you certainty and control of your business and your life. Unfortunately, most people's lives is controlled by their business, not the other way around. So I've identified a seven-step formula. So what happens is business owners over the years have come to me and say, can you help me get more customers? Oh, okay, you are talking to me sales and marketing, are you? I go, yeah, okay, which one in particular? Do you want the phone to ring more or do you want to talk about conversion rate strategies? Nearly every single time I ask that question, oh, I want the phone to ring more. Oh, okay. What's your conversion rate like then? Oh, it's pretty good. <laughs> okay. Exactly what is it? Do you know? Do you measure? Less than 1% of businesses measure their conversion rate with a spreadsheet or a CRM or anything. You can look at a report on a weekly basis. So I say, all right, well, maybe we need to be thinking about measuring before we start talking sales and marketing because maybe your conversion rate's not as good as it is. What's your net profit margin? Uh, what's that? 
Okay, all right. Well, I don't really want to talk to you about sales and marketing unless I know your net profit margin because if it's negative and I get you more customers, you go broke faster. If we market an area of your business that gets a lot of sales that you're running at a loss because you don't know that, then that sends you broke faster as well. There's too many risks to grow a business fast, so I want to measure, I want to find out what's going on. When you measure, you start to identify a whole lot of great opportunities or weaknesses. A great opportunity is your conversion rate's 10%, not 30 or 50 or 100. Your conversion rate's low. I go, excellent opportunity. That's not a bad thing. That's a great thing because you can triple 10, quadruple 10 with good training. So when you measure, you find the strategies and a plan is a series of strategies that you implement to achieve your goals quite effortlessly. And we need to put systems in place because if you triple your number of customers, you need to triple the number of employees. Therefore, you need to do a lot of recruiting really, really quick, and therefore, you won't have time to do systems after that. So we need to get systems in place before we do explosive growth marketing or sales skills training. We need to have that in place before. We need a whole lot of things. So before I tend to work with business owners as step six, I say we've got to do step three, then four, then five before we get to that. But to do measuring, it's not a one-person activity. It's a whole-person activity. Everyone in the business needs to be measuring all facets of the business, not just how much money have I got in the bank, that's good. It's what most business owners are running on, how much have I got in the bank, that's good, I can pay wages, that's great. As instead of saying, what are the leads for the week, what are the conversion rates for the week, what's the average whole sale, what's the gross margin we've made, how much money is at the bank, a whole lot of things. So therefore, we've got to get everyone involved in measuring, not just your business owner, but everyone. We've got to get your team involved. We've got to turn staff who don't give us staff about your business that much what they call staff, into team members. And by doing that, they get a bit motivated and they want to get involved with measuring. If you've ever tried to get your staff to quantify things and you haven't done measuring, I almost guarantee to bet you've had a lot of problems getting them to measure because they just too busy, don't want to, not interested, apathetic, whatever. So I've found you've got to do measuring after you introduce team building. And when you measure for a while, you, your team start to realise that you need systems. So instead of trying to put systems in and forcing them to use them or putting in too many systems and turning them into robots and then they don't think, then we need to do measuring, we need to do team building. So that's the three things, those subjects we touched on earlier we've got to do. All right, but before we've got to motivate the team, we've got to motivate you. Now, I love the saying, it's a great saying, there's no such thing as an unmotivated person. There's a person without a very clear vision of what they're trying to achieve. I've found business owners have very poor visions. Why? Because I've dealt with hundreds and hundreds of and of us and what's your vision for your business? What do you really want to achieve? I'd like to make more money one day. Hmm, okay, that's no vision whatsoever. So by clarifying and working with business owners, exactly what do you want from business? What do you want in two years? What do you want in five years? What do you want in 10 years? What do you want personally from having a great business that pays you a lot of money and frees up your time. What are you going to do with all that time? What are you going to do with all that money? And most people can't answer that question very well. So I found I've got to do that first. But when I do it, it gets them motivated. It gets them a bit excited. Then I go, great, let's turn that into some enthusiasm. Let's talk to the team about the fact you actually do want to grow this business because you've probably kept it a secret. Let's talk about that. And there's a powerful principle. Commonality creates unity. When you have something in common with a person, you start to unite with that person. It's the same with your team. Your team needs a common goal so that you're all focusing on it. Commonality creates unity. Unity leads to harmony. Harmony leads to synergy. Synergy leads to productivity. Productivity leads to profitability, net margin. In other words, instead of paying your staff $100,000 a year and you get 300,000 turnover, you pay them 100,000 a year and you're getting 400,000 turnover because they are more focused and driven and, and united and synergizing with each other. That's the power of step two. So net margins start to increase from step two. Step three is when we really accurately identify net margins of everything you're selling and within a week I've had clients drop $800,000 worth of their turnover of what they sold because in a week of measuring they've just gone, oh, wow, am I making a big loss? I can't do that for a loss. I'm not doing that anymore and they just get out of it completely. Profits go up because they're not carrying a loss in their business. So that's a brave call but this is the power of certainty with decision making. So that's measuring and it's a very big subject. Then we plan, then we put systems in, then we get into sales and marketing strategies. By the time we've done all that, we're actually moving into developing the business to management 
which is kind of the phase of putting all these six things together as subjects and automating the business. And automation is where you can set the business up. And I got clients, first client I did this with, where he said, I don't all work in my business at all. I went, ooh, that's a challenge. That's going to be a good fun thing to figure out how to solve that challenge. Let's put all this stuff together that I've been working on for years and let's see if we can do it. We did. Got him completely out of his business. Then I did it again, then I did it again, then I did it again. I've had multiple businesses move interstate because I put a sort of management structure up that reports to them every week by spreadsheets so I don't even have to talk to anyone. The numbers tell them whoever's running their business is doing a great job because every week you can see a trend and, and then they're reacting based on numbers telling them what their attention is. So this seven step formula I put together, very, very powerful. It's a seven month training program that I teach business owners these seven steps. So if you're thinking about growing your business and you don't follow this seven step process, you're going to grow for a while, then you'll stop and then you'll get frustrated. I constantly see business owners trying to implement one of these and they're typically trying to do step six marketing when they don't have a team. They got no time because the team aren't pulling their weight or they got poor team, they got staff who don't give us staff, so they got to get good quality people. That's why they have no time. That's why they're frustrated. That's why they're stressed. That's why they're letting customers down because they don't have a good team. They think they do, but they don't. Then you need to measure we need to do all these things. So I've tried all these out of order over the many years of working with clients. It doesn't work. It took me 10 years to figure out there is a formula. Um, this is what I like to teach business owners. I do a little bit of marketing in step one just to teach people that entrepreneurially you can make money from marketing that takes virtually zero time. So I teach people in step one how to automate some marketing. And an admin person can spend about three minutes a day on it once it's set up. So business owner doesn't have to be involved at all. So that's what you can do with leverage with marketing and all that. So it's the seven steps to business freedom. So let me tell you a little bit more about it. It's the business freedom workshop series. This is the cover of a ring binder that attendees get. In that ring binder is nine workbooks and it's about a total of 600 plus pages. That's a lot of content because I've systemized how I grow businesses. And you, if you were in the training, would receive these systems. So you're getting finished systems, not, hey, there's a whole lot of principles. Off you go. You go and figure it out for yourself. You go and create all the things that you need because I've just told you something that you've got to go and do. So you're getting the systems already finished. It's a complete system training. I've never seen anything close to this anywhere in the world where people are giving you the systems of how to do the things I've been talking about in this training. It's, it's done. You know, Most of it's done, not all of it but most of it is done. The big chunky ones are actually finished and done and try and find anyone in the world that's giving you content that you get a full recruitment system done, a few other things. So where it all begins, entrepreneurial thinking insights. The first step is I talk about leveraging. I give you some really powerful insights. I talk about how to set up a social media marketing program that starts generating leads for your business very, very cost effectively. Um, runs automatically. You, you spend about five minutes a week on it. Um, admin person spends about three minutes, five minutes a day on it and that's a pretty interesting thing to be setting up. So that's something I te teach people in the first step. I talk about some clarification. What are you trying to achieve in life? What are you trying to achieve with your business and goals and dream? I talk about setting up your thinking. So I'm teaching you how to think. I change your mindset towards business in the first workshop. It's designed to change your mindset and I get you thinking more entrepreneurial, just like I've been doing a little bit here this afternoon. That's the first step. You get powerful techniques to empower your team because if you want to free up time, you don't just stop doing things. You get someone else to do it. Well, most people don't delegate very well. They might abdicate or they get frustrated so they end up doing it themselves. Well, that's because you haven't learned the leverage and there's some really strong people skills in order to do that. One of them is disk profiles. Um, I meet a lot of people now, I know disk profiles. I go, good, what's my disk profile? Did you pick it in five seconds on the phone when you talked to me first? Because when you know disk profiles, you can pick 90% of people on the phone in five seconds. Then you know how to be each disk profile. Then you know how to build rapport. You know how to lead. You know how to teach. And you know how to persuade each disk profiles. And very few people I've met anywhere in the world have that skill. So I'm taking people to that skill set level. I talk about the five levels of team building. It takes seven months, six to seven months to get to the fifth level. But the fifth level is where your team will start saying things like, um, boss, can you not come in tomorrow? Or have you got something else to do? Uh, why is that? Oh, you're in our way. And we prefer it if you're not here because we're more productive. 
and they're telling the truth. <laughs> the fifth level is where your team is so empowered that you're kind of getting in their way because you've leveraged, you've delegated, and you've taught, and you've trained them, and you've led them and empowered them. That takes six to seven months to get to that level. How to run effective team meetings. You need to run weekly team meetings every single week and there's a real skill in how to set them up. You've got to say exactly precise things to make a team meeting work. I've refined that over a long, long time of teaching team meetings to every client I've ever worked with, so it's extremely refined. The exact wording of exactly what you say every meeting, you take minutes of the meeting, you repeat the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, all sorts of mechanisms, science go into that, and that's extremely effective, but you must bring numbers into the team meeting because it's the three skills of business. We run a team meeting, get everyone talking, then we bring numbers in, and then we start talking about systems, and then we keep talking about numbers and systems in team meetings, and then you really evolve it. If you're not running team meetings, it's very hard to get net margins up high. A complete recruitment system. If you go to Google, in double inverted commas, type in um, recruitment system, or do-it-yourself recruitment system. See if you can find one. I did a research on this at the start of the year, and there is no recruitment system you can buy anywhere in the world where it's a system you can buy. And recruitment companies charge about, I don't know, eight to 10,000 plus these days to hire one person for you. So what's a recruitment system worth to you if you have the ability to hire great quality, great attitude people that work as hard as what you do for the rest of your life, and you haven't got to pay anyone to help your recruitment again? What's that worth to you? Put a value on that. If a recruitment company want to charge you five to $10,000 to do one, and you're probably going to need to hire another five people in the next five years, well, well, they charge you 50 grand for it, or you're going to struggle and stress and think you can't get good people, so you put up with the poor ones you have. So that's, there's a bit of value on that that I like to give business owners. Influencing training. So teach you how to influence your team to do what you want to do. What else? Well, you get the spreadsheets. They're already done. Done for you, and I customize them with you. Now, I've been giving business owners spreadsheets for a long time, and when they say, Tim, it doesn't do this, eh, okay, that's a good idea, I'll change it. Uh, it doesn't do this, uh, but my business needs this. Okay, let's change it. Change, 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 change. Three years, I haven't had one person tell me they need to change. They're done, they're finished. So I just teach you how to customize them. They come with videos on how to set them up, and some of my clients just gave the video to their very empowered, switched on, good attitude admin person, said, here, watch video, start using spreadsheet please and they start using it so the spreadsheets measure all facets of your business not just a little bit of it I mean all of it all facets of your whole business except for say online marketing where you need Google Analytics it doesn't do online doesn't need to Google Analytics does it all for you um, but it measures all the facets of sales production cash flow P&Ls uh, ratios all sorts of things and they're customized so I spend two one-hour conversations with you on the phone talking about it and also what the numbers mean. So I allocate two full appointments to you in my training for that time, and once I've taught them to you, I say, I want to see your spreadsheets every week for the rest of the workshop series, and I'll give you feedback on what the numbers are saying. So, that. so it's like me one-on-one -on -one saying, do this, don't do that, we'll look at this, do this, there's an opportunity. Hey, if you did this number, you could achieve that. Um, I had a physiotherapist once that, um, emailed me her spreadsheets after a month and I, I studied them for a while because that was in planning, we're into the planning section which is where, the, where this conversations come up. I studied them for a while and she was out of Gatton. Now Gatton's a pretty small place and she only had three employees. In fact, I think she was turning over 400,000 and I look at her spreadsheets and I said, gee, if you really focus on this type of service that you're doing here because the numbers are revealing it and these numbers are confirming it so the sales and marketing were confirming production I said you need to do this this and this if you do this I reckon you could add about 150,000 to your net profit in the next 12 months without spending a cent more on marketing so we went oh you're right that was a pretty interesting in, in conversation where I just showed her how to make but this is I spot these opportunities because I'm seeing my numbers in my spreadsheets or your numbers in my spreadsheets and the spreadsheets tell me the opportunities. So I teach you that power of interpreting what those numbers are telling you. Measuring your business activity. Here's a screenshot of one of the spreadsheets that I give business owners. In business, you've got to do three things. You've got to get work. That's called sales. Then you've got to do the work. That's called production. Then you've got to get paid for the work. That's cash flow. What this spreadsheet does, it tracks all three of those every week by putting numbers in one row. You can see the numbers over here in week five. 
and sales 17,000. So if you go over here, you'll see that there's, oops, sorry, this one here, that's the latest one. See, so it says down the bottom, it's got week eight, so that's week eight. So that figure there is graphed here, and that figure there is graphed here, that figure there is graphed here, that figure here is graphed there. Now, if this is your business, and this is your capacity of all your employees doing the work, which is how many employees you have doing the work called production, and you saw this trend, I'm hoping these numbers would point out something, and they may not quite because you've never seen this before, and you might be a little bit confused. But if I looked at this number, I'd said to the business owner, man, you seriously got to crank up sales fast because you're getting through the work you've got, and your sales are declining. You're going to run out of sales. You're going to run out of work. That means you're paying full bat salaries to people that don't have enough to do, which means it's going to dry up your cash flow, and then you're going to run out of money. What are you doing to get the sales up? You either need to crank up the sales really quick, or you need to put someone off. And see how this spreadsheet is giving decision-making criteria with absolute certainty of what you need to do right now as a business owner to solve the problems in your business. So that's an example, one of the spreadsheets. So I'm giving you the tools to track this. So the narrow one is leads, but if you notice the leads are trending down as well, ooh, that's a big problem. Now if the leads were up, it's a temporary problem because the leads are trending down, there's a problem in this business because sales are dropping and so are the leads. Now, if your leads increase 20% next week, because in this example, the leads are down to 11 and they were at 15, so that's probably a bit more than 20%. So if your leads had to increase 30%, how long is it going to take for that to happen? Most businesses, they can't turn a switch on and make it increase 30% next week. It might take a month. So in this case, the business owner might be doing the most popular business growth strategy there is, hoping, <laughs> hoping that the work picks up. Hope is a very popular strategy. When the numbers are saying your leads are dropping and your sales, you're in dire straits. You are overstaffed. You need to put someone off. And the numbers give you that certainty to do that. Now, it's a pretty powerful spreadsheet, but that's an example of one of the spreadsheets you get in the training. So that's what it's tracking. Number of calls is a narrow one. Dollar value of acceptances of sales is a wide one. This is the actual work in dollar value being done in the week by the production technical people. This is how much money is hitting the actual bank account cash in figure as well. And the narrow band is a gross margin. It's too technical for this training webinar to get into that. But put it this way, if you're not measuring these things, your business is out of control. You're not managing it because management is saying, I've got to get the work, I've got to do the work, I've got to get paid for work. If you're not tracking all three of these, you are reacting with probably a lot of stress to knowing what your business is really doing. That's just a little sample of um, some of the stuff that I talk about in this training and how advanced this training is. So this spreadsheet, you get it blank and it's got samples. So, And I talk you through how to set it up. I talk to you about how to set up your range. I talk to you about how to set up your benchmark. You get all the training on how to use these tools that I'm giving you. And it's yours. Use it forever, whatever business you own. Do you like the sound of that? Are you grasping the spreadsheet? Does it make sense to you? Now, retailers need slightly different ones. So this is not the retail version. This is the service manufacturing version. So different businesses sometimes need different things. But this is just an insight of some of the stuff that I teach people how to do. All right, so what you're going from the workshop, I talk about 17 net profit margin strategies. You'll hear people, business coaches say, oh, I've got hundreds of strategies to increase your profits. No, they're actually turnover strategies. They're not net margin strategies. They're not net profit strategies. They're turnover strategies. Get more customers is a turnover strategy. So 17 of these, these strategies start to unlock the big profits without spending more money. You also get um, a spreadsheet that identifies 155 of the best strategies. I know a lot more than that, but I use and recommend about 155 strategies without going too much even into online strategies. And it's got deselection criteria. So you go, okay, I'm not a manufacturer. Okay, let's deselect manufacturer. I'm not a retail. Let's deselect. Um, I'm not a wholesale. Deselect. Okay, we're left with service. Good. Okay. Now we've shortened the list, and then it's got all these other specific criteria. So in the end, you're going to identify your best 50 to 70 strategies for your business. And you get 50. I'll help you to find the 50 best ones for your business, and the ones that really matter are the next best 12, but it's nice to know you've got another 40-odd after you work on the first 10 for the next year or so. And 90% of my strategies cost zero to implement. They're not advertising strategies, in other words. I talk about a lot about strategies that cost nothing to implement because they're not lead or advertising strategies. 
What else? Everything you need to have more time, more money, more productive stuff and greater certainty for every decision you ever make with people, with money, with marketing, with growing your business. So certainty is what gives you profit and power. So how the training works, we're going to do three hours a fortnight. This is an online training. It's the first time I've run it online. I don't see any difference with online to offline. Um, I've shortened it a little bit, mainly because there's less interaction with people talking, but it will be two-way dialogues, it's so everyone will have headsets, and I'll set it up so we can be in a video, so you'll be able to see me talking, whereas here in webinars, you can't set that up properly, so you'll be able to see me talking, you'll be able to hear me talking, and we'll be going through content, and it runs for different sessions, so it's two weeks apart. We do week one, then week three, then week five is team building and recruitment, then magic and measuring is the next two sessions, next two sessions planning to achieve your goals, next one is a review, spend a bit of time reviewing, so up to week 15 by now, then we do systems for profit growth, secrets of sales and marketing, management the final phase, then we do a final review and celebration at the end, so it runs for about 29 weeks in total. All right, different outcomes. People want to know, does it work? Absolutely it works. So minus 7% net margin to plus 12 net margin on a two million turnover business. This is a business up the Sunshine Coast. So it made them $366,000 net profit increase from applying all this content. Here's a plastering business in Brisbane that didn't talk to anyone. So sales wasn't relevant, didn't actually have a website because they tender for everything. So therefore marketing was something that wasn't relevant, yet they still went from 1.6 net margin to 11.5, 1.7 million to 3.2 million turnover. Engineering company out of Toowoomba, this is the one that I said added $400,000 to their sales because they came to a one-day sales training after the Business Freedom Workshop series. But they came in at 4.8% net margin. They were at 9.8 when they finished from workshop three, that is, to workshop seven in four months. They, for the whole financial year, by the way, this is, previous financial year, this financial year, they were actually cracking 12% per month, but at average 9.8 for the year. So it made them 388,000 increase in net profit. And that business went on a year later to employ a general manager that runs that company for them as a result of that training. Bathroom Renovator in Brisbane, it was doing pretty well at 17% net way over the 5% for the industry, 17% went to 22 and his turnover increased as well. So added 172,000 net profit. Optometrist in Brisbane, an upmarket optometrist retail, 16% net margin to 26% net margin, again, without any marketing strategies. And a mortgage broker, um, it's a wholesale mortgage broker, again, they didn't need marketing, they had all the clients they could get from 90 degree marketing, so net margin doubled in the time. So that's just some of them. There's a lot more examples on the website if you wanted to have a look. I'm really only looking for about three business owners, so it may be you, it may not. I'm looking for some minimum criteria. I prefer you to have been in business in you know, minimum two years. It's not an absolute have to, but I prefer it. But if you're very keen, you've got a good mind set and you've got a good attitude, then I don't mind. And 250k turnover is typically the minimum I want to see as well because then you're not going to keep talking to me about not having any money to pay to attend and things like that. So that's kind of the turnover figure I like to see as well. Unless you've got a bit of money in the bank. I've had clients that have great attitudes over the years that have um, had the money in the bank and say, look, I'm, I'm happy to, I don't need to get a return for six months, but I've got the money, I really want to do your training. Oh, okay, that's a good attitude. Three months later, they start making a lot of money. But I don't like them coming in saying, I can't afford to pay if this doesn't make money in three months. This is not a quick fix. This is a, yes, it's a J-curve growth. It starts slow and then accelerates. What I want to do is um, have a chat to you. It's really an application process. I want to have a chat to you and tell you a bit about it. And, uh, and we'll do that as a chat. Um, very soon, next week preferably. If you go to this website, wprofits.tv slash success, there'll be an application form and this just gives me a bit of background of your business so I'm aware of your background, your circumstance, um, so I can have a chat to you and see if you're, you're going to hit my eligibility criteria because if you're not ready for it, that's fine. I don't have a problem if you're not ready. Come back in a year or when you're ready. If you are ready, and you are open-minded to want to find out more about this, then I'd like to talk to you about it. And you can join my online training. The next steps, well, you'll be emailed uh, to confirm you are eligible. So um, 
if you if you fill in the application, I'll send you a video which will tell you a lot more about the content. I've got a 29 video, 29 minute video that tells you a lot more about what's in the content, a lot more about it, so you're understanding more about the seven steps and some other principles I've talked about. So that'll give you more. I'll email some other things. You'll be sent that video about it. We'll organise the time to talk, and, and we can do it in a video call. If you're in Brisbane, I don't mind getting together with you. I don't mind um, meeting you somewhere. Like um, I meet a lot of people at Eight Mile Plains at the Glen, because I'm on sort of southwest side. So if you're in Brisbane, I don't mind. I don't feel a need to see you to talk about your business. I don't feel a need to see your business because the things I talk about are not technical. I don't talk about technical. I don't need to see especially if you're a service business, there is nothing to see. I don't need to see you in your business. I've worked with clients all over the place and I've never met a lot of the clients I've actually worked with and I'll meet them months later, things like that. So we'll set up a meeting. We can do a two-way video call. Um, if you'd like to see me when we talk, I don't mind just doing a phone call. It's whatever you prefer. I don't mind either one of those. I'm happy to do it. I need to check you qualify and I need to check your timing is right. I say to some people sometimes, look, I don't think you're ready for it, but when you are, I, you got to hit these benchmarks. You hit these sort of goals and I think you'll be ready. Let's talk then. And I'll be frank with you. I don't want your money if it's not suitable for you. I look after my clients and I nurture my clients and I get clients loyal to me and want to come back year after year, looking at other things I do, attending different training I do because I look after people. There's no hard sell. I'm not interested in hard selling it. You have to want to attend it and you have to commit. Yes, you need an education. You need more information, possibly what I've told you here tonight. That's fine. Um, but let's just keep, let's just move forward if you're interested in exploring it more. So I'd like to say thanks for your time. It's been fun sharing these sort of principles with you. I, I haven't actually pulled out some of the stuff out of the Business Reading Workshop series to talk about some of these entrepreneurial principles. So I've enjoyed doing that. Hope you've had too. Sorry we've been a little bit over time. Um, what I would like to do, if you're not already on my newsletter list, I would think most of you are, but if you're not, then I've got your email from your registration. If that's okay, I'll send you an email. Um, ongoing newsletters, if you don't want them, just unsubscribe the first time you get it. and I'll have instructions on how to do that in the first email you, you receive. I, I don't pester people. I don't annoy people. I try and attract people with the quality of what I do. If you don't think this is for you, that's fine. Just unsubscribe. I don't have a problem with that at all. So if you're ready for extreme success, apply now. I'm looking to kick this off in a couple of weeks, um, 30th October, and looking to run at 8.30 to 11.30 in the morning. Now, if the time stone suits you, still apply and still talk to me, because sometimes I've had, I've actually talked to a few people, I've had three people, so I can't do that time. Uh, I go back to them, then sometimes I have changed the time. So I'm a little bit flexible with that, but that's what I want to do. I want to kick it off in a couple of weeks, and that's the time and the day that suits me, and that's every second week. Every second week, we do have a break for Christmas and all that sort of thing. But these are details that go through with you if you'd like to know more. All right? So wprofits.tv slash success. If you go there, you'll see a form. What will happen is you fill that form in and hit send or complete down the bottom. That will come to me in my inbox, and I'll send you a video link. I'll monitor that um, late today and tomorrow. Um, Definitely not Sunday, but today and tomorrow I'll have a quick check of my emails if I see it, then I'll flick you through the email. I'll send you some more information about it, and that way if you, you can watch the video before we sort of connect next week, and I'll catch up with you next week. So anyway, thank you very much. I've pretty much done the last slide. I'll, I'll put that one up there. Let me put that one up. So you got the last one there. So that's the link to it. If you go to seven with a number seven steps to business dot com, you can see or dot com that are you sorry. So the number seven steps to t o business dot com dot a u or look at any email I've ever sent you and it'll be on there. You you can see some videos from people and see some more testimonials of what sort of results I've achieved with clients as well from this training. So if you'd like to do that, you're most welcome. Look, I've enjoyed your coming. It's been good talking to you. If you've got any questions um, now, you can text me while we're still here. I'll finish up in a few minutes' time, but if you've got any questions, fire away now. If you haven't, well, it's been good talking to you on a Friday afternoon. And um, if you've got no questions, have a good weekend. And I'll catch up with you again soon, no doubt. And look, I'm open to talk. I'm happy to chat. I chat. I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm always talking to people, having a chat to people, getting to know people better. So I'm happy to chat with people. So if you want to do this thing, let me know. Have a chat to me. Fill in the application form. You don't have to do it. It's just optional. If you haven't got any questions now, looks like I don't have any questions then. 
All the best. Happy entrepreneurial learning people and um, have a great weekend. Join up with me on Facebook if you like and you can find my page on Facebook. Then um, you can find find me on Facebook with I Want Business Certainty. So if you go to Facebook and type in I Want Business Certainty, you can get some pretty cool stuff from me on that. I Want Business Certainty is my Facebook page and connect to me on LinkedIn too if you like. It's good to connect on me on LinkedIn. I release things through updates sometimes and you can, if you follow me, you can get stuff like that as well. So that's all available. Other than that, talk to you again soon, people. Thanks for coming and um, I'll, I'm looking forward to keeping in touch with you. I'll send you newsletters. I'll be giving things away. Go back to that book I've sent you, The Small Business Profit Report as well because you'll find some good things in there. And um, yeah, keep your eyes on your emails. I give books away every now and again too if you like this content. All right, thank you. All the best. Have a great weekend.